Hi everyone, Michael Howie here. Media sensationalism of wildlife conflict and its implications is a subject I've long been passionate about. And if you've been listening to the show or follow me on social media, you'll know it's something I frequently discuss. But what about the other side of the equation? Content creators such as myself also have a role to play in sensationalism, but more frequently through what we know in the digital age as clickbait. Can hyperbole in headlines, selective captioning of cute videos, and phrasing on Facebook posts have the same impact as media sensationalism? Does it help or hurt the animals when we push past fact and into speculation? And how can we, as content creators, control this and make sure our audiences are getting facts first? Join me in my webinar for the Compassionate Conservation webinar series on Tuesday, October 24th to hear the conversation and get solutions for making sure we stay the course for the animals. This webinar series will also include nine other presentations, including this week's guest, Sadie Parr, on a variety of subjects. Every webinar is free, but registration is required. Head over to thefurbears.com slash webinars to register now. This week's episode is supported by the Hardy Hooligan. This is Defender Radio. Defender Radio is brought to you by the Association for the Protection of Fur-Bearing Animals. It's the week of October 16th, 2017, and this is Michael Howie welcoming you to episode 450 of Defender Radio. It's Wolf Awareness Week, and while I'd love to celebrate by watching a beautiful documentary, uh, trying to howl at the moon, and maybe just not trimming my beard for a few days, Canada's wolves are in desperate need of help. Poisons that cause extreme suffering and death are being used to cruelly kill wolves. But there's an opportunity to get at least one of them out of our country. Strychnine, Compound 1080, and M44 cyanide devices are all used in Alberta to kill wolves, and anything else that comes into contact with them. Some of these poisons are also used in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Several permits that allow the use of strychnine in Alberta are set to expire in December of this year, creating a unique opportunity to outlaw these disturbing agents of death and raise awareness of the plight facing not only wolves, but all manner of carnivores targeted with these poisons through baiting. To understand why these poisons are being used, what other solutions exist for managing livestock conflict and protecting at-risk species, and how we can all be part of the change, Defender Radio was joined by Sadie Parr, Executive Director of Wolf Awareness, Inc. We'll be hearing from her and what you can do to save the wolves right after this break. When I'm looking for a meal that satisfies my hunger and my ethics, I head to the Hardy Hooligan here in Hamilton. They have incredible vegan versions of egg salad, chicken salad, and tuna salad daily, as well as savory pies, including my favorite, shepherd's pie pasty. They have amazing desserts and even locally roasted coffee in biodegradable cups. The Hardy Hooligan is definitely food worth rioting for. Check them out at 368 Main West in Hamilton, right by Lock Street, or find them on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, or online at thehardyhooligan.com. To me, the logical place to start this conversation is the fact that poison is being used in Alberta, um, as well, I believe as well uh, as potentially British Columbia. I'm not too clear on that, but we are focused on Alberta today. Um, and I think maybe the place to start is really what are the poisons being used? And then we can kind of go into why and how and when and where. Uh, so what are sure. the poisons we're seeing in Alberta uh, being used to poison wildlife? Well, the three main ones that we are focusing on are all classified as predicides. So that's a pesticide to kill a predator. And that involves strychnine, compound 1080, which is also called sodium fluoroacetate, and sodium cyanide, which comes in the form of capsules. Um, so all three of these have been banned in many other countries uh, most Canadians don't know that they are being used in Alberta in our country, let mm -hmm. alone, right? So it's uh, it's just, it's it's a great time to be discussing these issues. And why are they being used? I mean, what, well, 
let's rather than why uh, we know they're being used to kill animals, but why are poisons being used? What what is the the logic, if you can call it that, that a government or a a company is saying we're going to use this tool? Well, poison is a is a very inexpensive way to kill things. Um, I mean, as we know, it's it's non selective, so it creates a sterile landscape. But in terms of dollars and cents to put it out, um, you can give the impression that you are managing wildlife or taking care of a situation uh, without actually without actually really addressing the problem or creating a solution. All you're doing is removing an animal from the from the landscape in a vicious, horrendous way with the case of these substances. Um, so there, these poisons are being set out specifically, usually to target wolves and coyotes, where there has been evidence of uh, conflicts with livestock. Um, they're also strychnine specifically is being used to target wolves in an area called the Little Smoky Range of Alberta. Uh, there's a dwindling caribou herd there, numbering about 70 animals, I believe. And we've killed over a thousand wolves in the past 10 years under the guise of conservation for this caribou herd, um, which, I mean, don't get me wrong, the habitat has been extremely impoverished, largely by oil and gas, but other resource extraction and commercial recreation as well. Um, so we are, or government, the government of Alberta has sanctioned the killing of one species to save another. So poison, strychnine, is one of the methods being used to target wolves, as well as aerial shooting and snares. Um, the strychnine specifically it's, you know, even hunters are upset about this because there's 15 to 20 healthy ungulates, so elk and moose, that are killed every year just to use as draw baits to bring wolves into the area where they're overlapping with caribou. Um, now, strychnine is a food chain killer, so anything that eats the carcass of a victim, anything that consumes that dead wolf, um, whether it's an eagle or a raven or an endangered species walking through that area, then becomes victim itself. So it, it's a food chain killer. Also, baits are not only eaten by those that they're intended for, right? Um, there's many scavengers that share a landscape, and there have been many non-target species that have been killed um, in our efforts to kill wolves in this specific area. So those include, I mean, ravens, coyotes, um, lynx, the the non-target damage or, or collateral damage, as it's called, is is horrendous. And we don't we only know bare minimums because um, once an animal ingests these poison, they are sometimes on the move for hours. So not all bodies are recovered. And as I'd mentioned, you know the danger of that food chain killer passing it on to anything that then consumes what has become toxic itself. Um, the damage continues, and it's not only the number of animals, it's the cruel method um, and, and symptoms that each individual suffers before succumbing to a death. And that's what I'm looking at right now. I actually, I, I did a quick Google and ignored Wikipedia and went straight to the CDC. With strychnine, um, it does not look like it's... I think what we expect when we hear poison is that it's going to be like the, the euthanasia drug we use on our pets or something like that, where it's a very quick sort of you fade away and you fall asleep and that's it. But strychnine yeah. does not work that way at all. Um, no, it's um, when used as a poison, it, it kills by hyping up the entire nervous system in a series of convulsions. And so the afflicted animal really just stretches and wrenches its body to the point of paralysis. And this can be, sometimes this can last for hours. Mm -hmm. I mean, it depends on the dosage. It depends on what food that animal or that individual had in its stomach. But my guess is that strychnine induces one of the most painful and deliberate deaths that man has ever devised. So you'll never want to watch or experience the feeling of being responsible for the use of this substance. It really puts a giant question mark behind the meaning of the word civilization. And I mean, a lot of this I've learned from reading through older material. Um, 
you know, these poisons were prevalent in British Columbia and across the province, across different countries, you know, before we understood the ecological damage and the inhumane, really, um, um, process of this. These these chemicals have also been used to torture people. Um, so, like I said, a poison is a poison, and, and they're very, very, very dangerous to have on the landscape. Yeah, and it, uh, CDC notes that the cause of death is typically respira- uh, respiratory failure um, or brain Usually death. in the end, it's either respiratory failure, it's, sometimes it's cardiac arrest as well. Yeah, well, that makes um, sense, yeah. Most often it is, you're right, as- asphyxiation. Yeah, that's terrifying. Um, it's very upsetting to think about, too. I mean, I, I've seen raccoons in the throes of uh, distemper when they have those seizures that come as a result of that. And it's a very, very upsetting thing to see. And to imagine someone intentionally causing that um, is very difficult to fathom without feeling just a, an overwhelming anger or rage about it. Um, 100%. I, I don't understand how we can continue to condone the use of these. And I, I really largely believe it's it's happening because people don't know that it's mm-hmm. happening. Um, you know, there's an ignorance around this. So hopefully if we if we shine the light on how inhumane these products are and how reckless they are in terms of destroying, you know, ecological integrity, as well as posing threats to our pets and human safety, um, you know, there's several reasons to to ban all three of these poisons from our landscape. Um, but I think that, you know, I, we really have to start to understand that what we are doing is inhumane. Um, animal welfare has definitely become elevated over the past few years. And, I mean, the fact of the matter is that the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association specifically condemns strychnine and compound 1080 because they cause severe pain and seizuring before death. And all three of the poisons I've mentioned, so strychnine, compound 1080, and sodium cyanide, they're all... They all are what what are called um, convulsant causing. So they all create these violent seizures, respiratory distress, extreme pain, and an eventual death, maybe after one hour, maybe after one day. And the fact of the matter is we're not solving any problems using these. Um, You know, non-lethal options are are always better when it comes to managing livestock or also, you know, under the guise of conservation. I, I find it ironic and quite insane to be using poisons, um, you know, like I said, that, that will kill everything in a food chain um, under the guise of conservation. And it's that's something, ludicrous. that's certainly something we've been hearing about in the last few years is the um, secondary poisoning. And that's especially when we've got rats or other rodents who are considered pests um, being poisoned. And all the way up the food chain, including wolves and birds of prey and so on, um, becoming Mm -hmm. ill because of this. And that's a big debate in the United States and many Western states right now, I believe. Uh, Before we talk a bit about sort of the the policy and uh, the action items and everything, what is the delivery of these poisons? Because that's something, as a city boy, I would have no idea. I can pick out urban poison stations because they're clearly marked. They're those little black boxes. Uh, they're designed so certain, most animals can't get into them. Uh, I know what all the different traps look like and how they operate. But if I came across one of these, would I have any idea what I'm looking at? Uh, that I, I think that's sort of maybe something that we need to talk about too. Well, that's a good question, Michael. And I mean, just to draw that point home, there have been more than 93 dog deaths due to strychnine in Canada since I believe 93. So you can believe if if people knew (laughs) what they were seeing, um, they wouldn't be walking into situations like this. So there, you know, there may be regulations around um, requirements for signage if baits are placed. But we have to understand the fact of the matter that, again, we're talking about birds of prey and scavengers. So I've learned of incidences where a dog has been killed, and it was assumed that it was probably a raven flying over that person's backyard with a chunk of whether it was the original bait or had been scavenged from a victim. Um, That's how easy these things travel, right? 
So, but let me explain the different ways um, that each are delivered because they're fairly unique other than they're all delivered using a bait, right? So that simply goes back to you're not targeting anything specific when you're putting um, bait out there. So that in the Little Smoky area, like I said, there's often large draw baits being used. So strychnine can be placed within um, a large carcass or that it can also be placed in a smaller carcass. Sometimes um, a chicken head or just a smaller piece of meat is used. Um, but, but it's simply, you know, a piece of meat. Um, so those baits can also be used for, well, it's, you know, just meat. It can be roadkill that is used for the sodium cyanide devices. So these are mechanical devices. Um, again, an animal usually targeting a coyote or a wolf is supposed to be drawn into the area um, with with dead meat. Um, again, there's many, many scavengers that share this landscape. Yeah. But an M44 cyanide device is triggered when an animal pulls on that bait. And it's supposed to fire a cyanide capsule into directly into the mouth, into the throat of that animal. Um, but there's been a recent incident in the United States. Um, they've actually just, multiple NGOs have petitioned the EPA to ban M44 cyanide capsule devices, because another dog, a, ki- a, a dog was just killed by one. The young boy that was walking him was severely injured and is no doubt traumatized. And this followed within a month of having one of those devices kill an endangered species. Um, that was a wolf in the States, and uh, the wolf was listed. Um, but in any case, you know, within a period of one month, M44 cyanide devices had killed an endangered species, somebody's pet dog, and severely traumatized and nearly caused the death of a boy. Um, we didn't understand that these devices were still being used in Canada until we started looking more into the details behind strychnine and compound 1080, which we understood were being used. Um, but again, these are, these are just archaic, dangerous. I consider them as landmines yeah. um, because, you know, there have been, there have already been too many, too many non-target deaths and too many just deaths that are extremely inhumane. Um, the third one, uh, compound 1080, is delivered in different ways as well. So it can come in the form of tablets, which again are put into um, pieces of meat. Uh, it's also supplied in a liquid form in what is called a livestock collar. Um, These are most often placed around sheep. So it's a bladder of liquid that goes around the neck of the livestock animal. And they're more discriminate slightly in that it's not just a a bait that's drawing whatever in. It actually will not, um, it's not intended to release the poison unless something is attempting to bite that neck. Um, That being said, these bladders are known to rupture and leak for a variety of reasons, Um, whether it's a barbed wire fence or uh, getting caught on a bramble or a bush. Uh, you know, you can't, the, the fact of the matter is you cannot be too safe with any of these extremely dangerous poisons. They just, they don't belong out there. One more thing I'll add, Michael, yeah. is liquid strychnine is also used at a lower dose in liquid form. So in Alberta, this is available to farmers um, who are who are experiencing or who feel that they have problems with pocket gophers or other small rodents. Um, Again, we feel there are many different non-lethal alternatives. Um, You know, there's integrated pest solutions such as using rotational grazing and finding ways to coexist and co-flourish with wildlife in harmony as as we are farming. but this is another way that the poison is being 
placed uh, throughout our landscape. So in a, in Alberta in the spring, um, a farmer can order, uh, they can purchase up to two cases of liquid strychnine um, if they have a, a uh, an issue with, like I said, these rodents or what they deem as pests on their property. And is so is in order to get we're, it, we're, it's coating the landscape, right? Yeah. Well, in order to get it, and this this is the way we talk about trapping, um, is people say, oh, well, it's a highly regulated industry, and not anyone can just trap. Well, I buy traps online for demonstration purposes. Yeah. Uh, no one asks yeah. me any questions, and they're delivered to Urban Hamilton. Um, if I wanted to be a Horrifying. registered trapper, I would literally go to a two day course. How hard is it then for a farmer? Uh, to access this in Alberta? Is it is it a lengthy process where they need to do courses and get permits? Or is it very much to say, I'm a farmer, here's my business number, I want that? You know, that's, that's a really good question. And I mean, to tell you the truth, that really needs to be more scrutinized and we need to understand that better. Um, from, you know, just the original looking into this, it seems to be too easy to get. And I mean, I can back that up by saying we're talking about Alberta here. British Columbia does not have federal use permits to use any of these poisons in this province, the province that I live in. That being said, both strychnine and compound 1080 resurfaced this past winter and killed wolves, dogs, and coyotes. Um, This isn't legal, but how did these people obtain such products? Did they know somebody across the border? Um, Did they order it online? This is, um, you know, this is I think it's too easy to get. I've done simple searches, and yeah, I can order some of these products online from the United States. Um, That's horrifying to me, right? Um, So I I do think it is too easy to obtain these products at this point. Um, That being said, we need to understand more. I mean, I don't think that it's being overseen at the federal level to the extent that it needs to be. Um, I think there's a lot of passing the buck and assuming that the next person that we have delegated the responsibility to is going to adequately um, cover that base. I don't know that the training is provided, and I can tell you that, Michael, because, like I said, there's still many unknowns around what is legal, what's not legal, what is being done, you know, is is policy um, matching legislation. But I've mentioned that BC doesn't have a use permit for any of these products, but one of the things we're still trying to understand is that I went in and wrote a blind test and received a permit, a five-year use permit to... Um, use strychnine specifically as a restricted use for gophers. Now, that means I'm an end user. It doesn't mean that I'm necessarily allowed to get the product, but I don't understand why this process even exists in British Columbia. Um, Like I said, I don't know what that means. So still trying to dig and understand some of those things. But I think it's time that everybody start asking these questions. Yeah. you know, I've mentioned that these are horrendous in, term, in terms of their threats to all wildlife. Um, so biodiversity, including species at risk, including pets. And I mean, in terms of people, these substances have been listed by the FBI as likely to be used as chemical warfare agents in a terrorist attack. Um, it's incredible if you look at the history of uses, the dangerous these these poisons pose to people. And that's something that in this day and age, we really have to be careful about. And more attention is certainly needed in, in that regard as well. Um, so again, you know, the, the, the threats that these pose at every single level, for really absolutely no justifiable reason, um, it's ludicrous that, that these practices continue. And and I thank you for, for helping people to understand that they do. Well, and the, I, there's a couple of things I want to get into, and I'm going to come back and challenge something you had just said. Um, 
There are two things I want to talk about first, though. One is um, this East Kootenai situation uh, that happened in March. Um, and this is one I know you and I talked briefly about it just via email. And I know you talked with, with Leslie Fox, our executive director, about it. We ended up doing a uh, reward for information very quietly to try and help the conservation officer service in BC. And this was um, a an individual was uh, a dog was found uh, was was found to be poisoned, um, and the I have the CBC article up here. I believe you have it on your website as well. And it said um, a man contacted the COS in early March after his dog found and ate something from what looked like a white cupcake container in the area. Within minutes, the dog became ill and started having convulsions, which sounds exactly like strychnine. Um, when conservation officers then looked. They found 17 different batches of poison in a road uh, within several kilometers of each other in an area known to have wolves, known to have people. Uh, like this is a rural region, but it's not way out there. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, I think the following month, wolf carcasses were found. Um, and it's it really does raise a lot of questions. I think you you really nailed the how are people getting this, and that is very very concerning because it's again we're not talking about uh, some very generic thing like using bleach, which has very practical everyday uses in the household. This this is designed to kill animals and living things uh, in a very violent way. Um, so it, it is concerning that way, but it makes me think of a study by uh, Dr. Adrian Travis who found, mm -hmm. and I, I want to say Wisconsin, it may not have been Wisconsin, but somewhere in the Midwest, when the government instituted a cull of wolves, it actually increased poaching. And the idea is that it gave the indication that it's okay to kill wolves. 100%. Yeah, so great are, point to raise, Michael. Is that what you're seeing was, in situations like this, that same maybe kind of logic? What I would say so. Um, what our government is showing by example is that our wildlife has no value, that it is acceptable to treat things, um, including endangered species, <laughs> you know, because the, the parameters, uh, let's face it, a label does not protect a wide-ranging scavenger, such as a wolverine, such as the swift fox. You know, we know that there are endangered species that are in decline specifically because of these poisons, which are still being used. So to me, that does not show um, true leadership in terms of valuing biodiversity, our natural legacy, life in, in general, right? Um, and, and I very much am urging the government to do what's right. It, it's very simple. Um, like I said, there have been many other countries that have banned these products based on the dangers they pose to uh, to, to all um, and, and their high toxicity. But by, by using them, I mean, it feels we've created a map that shows the locations of where these have been placed in the past five years, and it almost looks like these poisons are being handed out as peppermint candies, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I imagine if I would found, you know, on websites just doing searches for local municipalities in Alberta, they're advertising, come and get your liquid strychnine now. Um, again, it's really condoning something that is immoral. Um, but if our government is is promoting that and using it to still wildlife to to manage our wildlife, um, and this comes through the Pest Management Regulatory Agency, which is a sector of Health Canada, I think that really speaks very very poorly of us as a nation. Um, but I. I I do, I really agree with that science that Travis did in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the uh, kind of main attitude or, or valuation that is um, provided for by the government is, is then taken up by the rest of society. And, you know, we've seen that in the past few years with, hunting as well. For example, the British Columbia government has really been promoting hunting and making it easier um, mm -hmm. for younger people to engage in it. And I'm, I'm specifically, uh, I'm speaking of all hunting in general, but I do know that, you know, 
the past few years, there have been more wolves killed recreationally in this province than ever before. Well, that's, to me, in line with the government is also, um, you know, condoning these experimental wolf reduction programs. So we're putting the message out that it's okay to kill one species for whatever reason, um, including recreation. And that is just, it, it's been taken up by people. And it's a very interesting time because, I mean, we see what's happened in terms of the grizzly hunt in British Columbia with British Columbians condemning it and saying, you know, no animal is a trophy. Yeah. So. I think we're almost at a renaissance period and there's there's people are really searching to be a part of nature but to figure out what that means to them. I think that the inherent value of species is becoming more and more accepted and recognized. Um, but in all of this, it really the government's so far behind in terms of management and policy. Raincoast recently did a fantastic article, you know, that in terms of wildlife management reform. We need a complete upheaval because as much as, um, you know, we've been talking about society liberating their standards if government is accepting use of poison or um, killing for whatever reason. At the same time, there's also, you know, been this huge um, societal shift towards, um, you know, valuing individuals and not condoning killing for convenience. So it's a, it's a great time to have these discussions and I think reevaluate our own species and our own goals um, because it's a choice, you know, these, our actions can be wasteful, they can be cruel, um, but they don't have to be if we understand that we can, that there all are better alternatives um, and that we can rise above that. It, it just really needs management to keep up with our contemporary understanding of biology and behavior and ecology and focus more on the holistic level than um, managing species by numbers or in a way that is just simply convenient to us. Again, we're in you know a time of biodiversity crisis. Mm -hmm. All management at this day and age should be for conservation and for preserving species functions or ecosystem functions and services as well as individual animals within it. And, you know, landscape killers or poisons such as this really just undermine all ecological integrity um, and, and create what's, what's a sterile landscape. And I don't think any Canadians would be proud of, of, of knowing the, the real damages that we are responsible for as we continue to, to use these products. I think it's interesting too that you talk about the the change in our age as a renaissance period almost. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the big problems that I see from coast to coast, uh, both here in Canada and when I speak with people from really around the world, is having the policy keep up with the science um, yeah. and with yeah. public opinion. And that's something that's really interesting. And I wonder how much is playing a role in this because it feels like a patchwork of policy. Uh, that is sort of creating the opportunity for some of these abuses, uh, as we were talking about, like in East Kootenai. Um, one thing I do want to touch on before we get to the uh, uh, potential solutions to this is uh, a bit of the devil's advocate game, talking about farmers. And this is something I try to be very, very sensitive to because it's not necessarily something I'm intimately aware of. It's not the way I was raised. So I try and provide the opportunity to understand more about it. And there are folks who are making their living raising animals, agree with it or disagree with it, doesn't matter. Uh, there are folks who are uh, raising crops every day, uh, all year round, and they will go outside and see, you know, if they have sheep, they will see coyotes or wolves. Um, if they are, uh, if they have corn or wheat, they'll go outside and they'll see birds and raccoons. And to them, it is a very real threat. And I think that's something that as advocates, we have to be very careful not to dismiss. Um, and you were talking about solutions. I think we do need to take just a, a brief moment to discuss, you know, when we're seeing this kind of uh, uh, conflict happening, regardless of sort of who has caused it, are there solutions that are accessible? Is this something that 
uh, uh, livestock owners or, or uh, farmers of any kind, do they have the agency to be able to say, there is this problem and the easy way to deal with it, the way we've always been taught to deal with it, which is you know poison or aggressive lethal control, is not the way I want to go. Is there opportunity there for us as advocates or for them as, as compassionate individuals to say, I want to do better? 100% there is. And I'm proud to say that, um, you know, we work with many farmers and ranchers who use and promote non-lethal methods for coexisting with the carnivores that share their landscape or that overlap with their livestock. So I think it's really important before we even touch on non-lethal, which I, I'd love to explain some of the methods, um, but we have to recognize that indiscriminately killing wolves or coyotes has also been found and is now understood to likely create more chaos and, and contribute to greater conflicts in the future because you're destabilizing a social unit of a wolf or a coyote family. And you know, there's there's many different things that go into this, such as, um, you know, you're disrupting their, um, the way that they limit their own population. Um, because you've, like I said, you've, you've fragmented a family, so rules go out the door. We can actually see an increase in density of wild canids, an increase in lone individuals or dispersers, um, and again, if they don't have the experience or the knowledge of how to hunt successfully for the appropriate prey, they might be more prone to go after livestock or something that's easier. So we have to recognize that, again, preemptively killing often creates a lot more conflict than um, than leaving the situation alone. But let's talk about some preventative measures for sure. Um, First, when you said you come out and you see a dog or a, sorry, a wolf or a coyote with your sheep, best case scenario, human presence. If there is a human presence established regularly, in many cases, that is enough to deter predators or large carnivores, dogs, uh, sorry, wolves, coyotes, bears, mountain lions, um, these are shy animals. So, you know, that old shepherding technique that's been used for thousands of years, that still has value today. It could be a range rider, um, but this also provides people with the opportunity to identify and remove vulnerable air animals, livestock from the area. So, I mean, whether that's, uh, you know, a, a calf with pneumonia or an animal that's twisted its ankle, um, if it's more vulnerable for any reason, it needs doctors. It needs attention, and if you can um, give it the care that is required, possibly even remove it as a vulnerable one from that area. Um, again, you're you're helping to prevent situations from occurring. A human presence is also critically important to identify livestock that dies naturally. This happens all the time. I, I speak with ranchers all the time. A huge culprit is poisonous plants later in the summer, but there's many different factors that, that can happen. I was recently just hearing media about um, two cattle that were found shot by hunters, right? In any case, having a carcass on the body is surely going to attract any animal that lives in the area that is likely to scavenge. Um, so if we can prevent them from getting their first meal by removing um, that carcass, you can uh, put it somewhere appropriate. You can use your uh, a composting system, um, but it's got to be done properly so that there is no reward that an animal can obtain. Um, the fact of the matter is if, if an animal is scavenged on your property, a predator is far likely to return to that area seeking its next meal. Um, just in the same way, you know, uh, somebody who's out fishing who lands a big fish is going to go to the exact same spot every time because they've been successful and they identify that as a as a uh, as a good source, right? Mm -hmm. So removing attractants and not bringing natural predators into the area, that also applies to times such as um, birthing, um, calving seasons, right? When those scents and smells are wafting across the landscape, um, increasing a human vigilance at that time. And 
one of the things that's been found is many conflicts do happen when calves are most vulnerable. Um, so if we can condense that calving season, make it short, and I'm not just talking um, for, a, for a single person, although that's where you start, but we've got to be work doing these things at the community level and working with each other so that we can, you know, coexist with, with wildlife all around us because we all know that large carnivores need vast territories. Mm -hmm. um, so if I'm protecting my area but putting them onto my neighbor's property, um, you know, that, that doesn't go over as well as if we're all working together. That being said, it's extremely important to recognize that not all wolves or coyotes predate on livestock. Um, there's many instances of them overlapping in territory and not causing a single depredation. And that is the best case scenario because they will defend that territory from other natural predators. So if you're not having problems, don't create problems by creating that social chaos. But we also have to put into perspective, Mike, that, you know, livestock losses, it's a maximum of 5%, and I'm being very generous there, mm -hmm. um, of, of livestock or cattle that are lost to natural predators. Um, again, Livestock is far more likely to be killed during um, calving or from respiratory or digestive problems, during transportation, through extreme weather. So, again, putting things into perspective. Um, large carnivores, wherever they overlap with livestock, there will be some losses. And I do certainly sympathize with a producer who has spent the time and energy in raising an animal and um, watching it or finding it um, killed or scavenged upon or whatever. I sympathize, but the important dialogue is one of prevention. We know that poison does not prevent um, the next incident from happening. It can remove everything from a landscape, but are you actually addressing the solution? Or is something else going to walk in that we're just going to conveniently poison as well? That's unacceptable, right? That is that is lazy. And again, in an age of biodiversity crisis, we've got to be more responsible than that. We've heard that these three types of poison are, are cruel. We There's clear evidence of this. We've heard that by having it available, it's being misused very clearly. And we've heard that there are solutions that render the need for it or the desire for it virtually moot. So the question now, and, and the final question to wrap up is, what can we do about it? Um, clearly, there, there are reasons to not have these poisons. There are reasons to find alternatives to killing. How do we make that happen as advocates, as wolf lovers, as, as just people who care in Canada? This is an incredible window of opportunity for permanent change if enough Canadians will engage. So first and foremost, during Wolf Awareness Week, um, we are collaboratively launching a movement, if you will say, to see these three substances banned across our country. So if people would go to a website, it's wehowl.ca poison free they will find multiple tools and different ways to engage um, beginning at beginning with contacting the right decision makers who are currently reevaluating the use of some of these products both at the provincial level and at the federal level so again it's an incredible window of opportunity for public comments um, strychnine is being reevaluated federally for the first time in 15 years. That's part of, you know, the process that these, that all pesticides go through. So it's a critical time for Canadians to step up and say, we no longer want to see these products on our landscape. And, and like I said, if they're available in one place, they're going to be available somebody will find a way to use them in across a border, across a boundary, in a protected area. This has to be a nationwide movement. Um, so contacting decision makers, including your local MP, that's one of the most important things you can do right now is 
ask them to engage in this and ask them to push for a poison-free Canada. Our comment forms on this website will also take you to the Minister of Health for Canada. Um, as well as other appropriate decision makers. We have a petition being worked on. And again, this is a collaborative approach. It it combines and involves many different non-governmental organizations across the country. Some are environmental and conservation groups. Some are animal welfare groups. We also, also have scientists and veterinarians on board. And we really just hope to grow this movement as a collective and hope that others will engage and begin to endorse it. And a snowball effect will come on as the awareness grows. So really just getting to that we have a poison-free website um, taking action from there, engaging at your local level, talking to your peers, sharing the information that is provided through social media channels. Um, And then, as a Canadian, printing up your own form, collecting more signatures on a petition that we can formally submit um, if we need to. Hopefully, the public outcry will be enough to wake Canada up to say, well, right, we're celebrating our 150th birthday of Confederation. We have come beyond this. There is no place in Canada for this anymore. Um, I believe we're there. We can do that if enough voices rally behind the cause. And that really takes, you know, sharing the information, creating awareness, staying engaged until we see change on this. Um, So getting those comments in now, as well as during the comment period in March. So one opportunity that I I also want to specify is Alberta's provincial use permit as a predicide, so to kill black bears, coyotes, and wolves, expires December 31st of 2017. Let's get enough Canadians demanding that this is the last predicide use permit they have for strychnine. It's time for this genocide to stop. Um, we can do so much better than this, Mike, and I, I believe we'll get there if we all unite. To find out more about the poisons used against Canada's wolves and send a letter to your MP, visit wehowl.ca. To learn more about Wolf Awareness, Inc., visit wolfawarenessinc.org. That's it for this week, folks. Please remember to subscribe to Defender Radio on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts, and sign up for email alerts at thefurbears.com slash updates. I'm Michael Howie for Defender Radio, reminding you to stay informed and stay strong.